Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Esri GeoDev webinar series. About three years ago, we started this series as a way to continue engaging in developer-related topics and discussions in between Dev Summits. Speaking of which, we have our next developer summit coming up in Berlin, November 9th through 12th. We have a lot of new topics, advanced features, and additional functionality to share with you over the coming months. So be sure to stay connected with us through our GeoDev webinar series page on go.esri.com slash geodev or any of our social media accounts at Esri Geodev. We would love to have conversations like these taking place throughout the year so that when we do meet at one of these Dev Summit conferences, it will be as though we never stopped. We hope you get as much or more out of this webinar than you anticipated. Now we would like to introduce you to today's webinar, ArcGIS Pro SDK for .NET Extensibility Patterns. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface, and you should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default, but if you would prefer to join over the phone, just select Use Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time throughout the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce you to one of our presenters, Chris Zent. Let's get started, shall we? Thanks, Amy, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session, ArcGIS Pro SDK for .NET Extensibility Patterns. I am a product manager on the desktop team where I focus on the Pro SDK, and I am joined by my colleague, Rob Burke, who's an instructor uh, for Esri and teaches the ArcGIS Pro SDK course, extending ArcGIS Pro with add-ins. Good morning, Rob. Hey, Chris. Uh, good morning, and uh, I'm pretty excited about today. We've got some great topics to cover. Yeah, definitely looking forward to it. It's great to get to uh, team up on this webinar once again. All right, so here's our agenda for this morning. We're going to start off with a quick overview of the Pro SDK, and then we're going to dive into our four extensibility patterns. We're going to start off with traditional Pro add-ins, go into managed configurations, plugin data sources, and core host applications. We'll wrap up with a little bit of information about the roadmap and resources, and then we'll take some of your questions. All right, so the ArcGIS Pro SDK for Microsoft.NET provides templates and tools for using Visual Studio 2017 and 2019. We always support the latest two releases of Visual Studio. Once you've installed the SDK, you can see that it provides in the lower right-hand side a set of templates which provide a, a starting point for each one of these extensibility patterns. Each one of the templates matches those patterns. We also have item templates which are provided which provide you that user interface and uh, all of the different types of capabilities that you would like to customize the Pro UI. The access that's provided via the SDK um, provides that overall link to the APIs. So then once you've got the SDK installed, you can start working with the editing, layout, map expiration, and many other APIs that are exposed and installed uh, directly with ArcGIS Pro. To together, to collectively, the Pro SDK and the Pro APIs, we refer to as the Pro SDK. With it, you can take advantage of all of your .NET desktop development. You can take advantage of Windows Presentation Foundation, or WPF, Model View View Model, MVVM, and asynchronous programming. So all of your applications will be running uh, well and very performant and leaving the pro user interface uh, available to your users. All of our releases for the SDK are in sync with ArcGIS Pro. So we had a release back in February with 2.5, and we got one coming up here at the end of July uh, with 2.6, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The ArcGIS Pro APIs and assemblies. This is just a big view of all of the different Pro APIs that the teams 
have been making available over the years. So everything from content down to utility network, we've got a lot of capabilities for you that are installed directly with ArcGIS Pro uh, in the assemblies. On the right-hand side, you can take a look at some of the core assemblies and extension assemblies, which are installed when you install ArcGIS Pro. So a little bit different than ArcObjects SDK, if you've been doing customization over the years with ArcMap, these are installed directly as you install ArcGIS Pro. So the only thing that you have to install with the SDK is the SDK itself. And here, looking at the installation, uh, the screenshot here is of the Manage Extensions dialog in Visual Studio. This is one of the preferred ways of actually installing the SDK, and it's a very lightweight install. And um, again, you can install this for my Esri, from my Esri, as well as Visual Studio Marketplace. And we install, we support, uh, again, the latest two releases of Visual Studio and all of the additions, including the free community edition, professional and enterprise. Okay, and along with the SDK itself, we of course, with the SDK are providing lots, an extensive set of samples and documentation. So all of the community samples are out on GitHub, and these provide really great starting points for all of your work with the SDK. The ready to use C Sharp solutions that you can uh, try out all the different patterns. You can see a few screenshots here of um, samples related to the using the scene layers API, uh, calculating some volume, uh, map exploration API in the lower right, where you can actually start working with animations. Bottom left, real time stream layers API, so you can start working with stream layers in 2D and 3D and uh, try some geofencing. We have code snippets for all the patterns and APIs. We have an extensive API reference and set of documentation that's all up on GitHub with walkthroughs as you get started. So now let's get into the extensibility patterns. And we just wanna give you a quick overview before we dive into each one of them. The first is traditional add-ins. You're gonna be developing new tools and functionality here and customizing the Pro UI. And again, this is analogous to the ArcMap add-ins that you may have been developing since ArcGIS 10.0. Here in the screenshot is one of the add-ins that have been provided by one of our partners, Cyclomedia, and this is their Street Smart for ArcGIS Pro add-in. You can see on the lower portion of the uh, interface here that they have created a Cyclorama viewer pane, which allows users to actually use the 360-degree uh, Cyclomedia imagery and actually capture features directly from within the imagery. So this is a really exciting integration that this partner has made here. Looking at one more, the Unconventionals Analyst by Expert at, the team here has built a custom tab on the ribbon, which walks the user through a custom workflow. And then they've built a custom dock pane uh, that you can see on the right-hand side of the screenshot, which guides the user through the workflow and the inputs to the different tools and provides some feedback as well. So that's add-ins. Let's take a look now at the next pattern, managed configurations. So these provide all the capabilities of add-ins, traditional add-ins, plus the ability to manage the startup experience of, of ArcGIS Pro. This is a screenshot of one of our uh, community samples, Config with Start Wizard, which allows you to actually create a custom start page and see a custom start page here which has uh, content from ArcGIS Online. We're just looking at some of the available projects uh, and that's showcased here on the start page. Um, also with managed configurations, you can see that you can streamline the user interface for Pro. So as Pro starts, you have just those tools on the ribbon and just the tabs that you wanna make available for your users as they begin to work with perhaps a very focused workflow. Moving on, our third pattern here is plug-in data sources, where you can make a custom data source available for use in the Pro user interface. So if you have custom data that perhaps is not supported as a, as a data source for ArcGIS Pro out of the box, well, you can start working with making that available. 
and you can add it to the Pro User Interface as a read-only feature layer or as a standalone table. And our last pattern is core host applications. So you can have standalone applications with access to the ArcGIS.core assemblies. So these standalone apps could be console or WPF applications. And as they tap into ArcGIS Core, you can get access to the geodatabase, geometry, and utility network APIs. Okay, so those are our four patterns. Let's dive into the very first one, add-ins. So how do add-ins work? So add-ins them themselves will be extending ArcGIS Pro through buttons, tools, dock panes, and so forth, all the different types of controls and customizations that you would need to provide those tools to your users. You can integrate your own custom functionality as you choose and just use those pro APIs that are needed for your customization. When you compile your add-in uh, in Visual Studio, it's packaged within a single compressed file and it has an Esri add-in X file extension. And it's placed by default into this well-known folder, this path that you see here. And as Pro starts, it looks into your well-known folders as you designate and loads up those add-ins and the associated DLLs and resources that you have as part of your add-in. So uh, just looking at the screenshots here, you can see that we have the animation tools.esri add-in X, and that is a community sample which provides just a couple um, groups here on the animation tab. So you've got the vehicle animation settings group and the build animation group. Okay, moving on. Very similar again to ArcMap add-ins, Pro add-ins provide you the ability to work with desktop application markup language as it's called, or DAML. And so add-ins use DAML to define, define all of the user interface elements in Pro. So you're gonna be actually using a XML sort of syntax here to define these elements, and they're stored within a file called the config.daml. Looking again at this animation tools sample, you can see that in the daml, we've defined uh, two groups that are going to be updating the Esri mapping animation tab. And as we look at the first group, which is that caption vehicle animation settings, we can see that there's an edit box and a combo box that have been defined for that. And on the build animation uh, group, we have two buttons. Okay, so that's DAML. All right, so as always, making these uh, concepts a little bit clearer for you, we're just going to do a quick demonstration here, building an add-in with a feature construction tool. Okay, so here I've got Visual Studio 2019, and I'm just going to create a new project. I've filtered here as I have the SDK installed. You can see that we've got just those templates associated with the SDK. And again, we have four of them matching each one of the patterns. We're going to select this one for the add ins. And I'm just going to put in a new name for our construction tool. Go with our default path here. And as Pro starts, it's stubbing out the solution. And you can see in the Solution Explorer on the top right-hand side, we've got a couple uh, folders that have our custom images set for uh, reflecting dark and light themes inside of Pro. We've got our config.daml, and that's opened uh, automatically here. And we've got our module, and every add-in has a module as a central hub for a lot of your work. I'm going to call out here this, this GUID that you see right at the top of this add-in info. And we'll see that later, that as the add-in is compiled, it's placed into a folder with that GUID as its name. Got a little bit of information here, and then come down how, uh, and you can see these sections that have been stubbed out for uh, your tabs, your groups, and your controls. We don't have any controls yet, because of course, this is a brand new um, project that we've created. All right, so we're going to go ahead now and create our construction tool. And as we open up these, we're going to see that we've got our ArcGIS Pro add-ins available here. 
and all of our item templates are made available here. And again, these are all those nice interface, user interface elements that you'll be able to take advantage of. Here's our construction tool. We'll go with the default naming convention and add this to our project. All right, so as we get to the top here, we can see that there are some sketch types. The uh, construction tool is again going to construct a feature and we're by default given the opportunity to sketch points, but we're gonna go with polygons in this scenario. So I'm going to comment that out and uncomment this line, making it really easy just to get to polygons. There's other types of supported sketch types as well. Um, down here is the on sketch complete async, which this method is where you're actually going to be using the geometry from the sketch. And here we're using some of the editing API and taking advantage of creating an edit operation and then queuing that edit operation up. And here I'm going to just insert some custom code and leverage that in this section. So let's just walk through it. Here I'm going to be taking the geometry that we sketched and basically using that to get the area. I'm gonna convert that from meters to acres. And then we're gonna round off that value to two decimal places, convert it to a string, and provide it into the message box right here. So as we sketch the geometry, we'll get a message box which tells us the area. Just a little quick example of how you could actually insert some custom logic. I'm gonna set a breakpoint and we'll come back to this later. After this dialog um, uh, is shown, it actually executes the create operation and actually you're able to see the newly constructed feature. Let's come back to the config.daml. And again, this is for creating our user interface, so how we're gonna be working with this actual tool. One of the points here, uh, here in our newly stubbed out construction tool is how you're gonna be working with this construction tool and the type of feature that you're gonna be using. In this case, we've changed it over to polygons. So that's the type of um, feature when we're using the create features pane, we want the tool to become activated with polygon features. So that's what we've done here. I'm gonna do one more quick edit for the tool tip just so we can identify our tool. So we're gonna construct a polygon and show acres. Okay, all right. And with that, we're gonna build our solution. And I'm just gonna show you this well-known folder again. So as the solution completes building that, there is the GUID that we saw before in the config.daml. And here's our construct tool demo uh, add-in that matches our solution and project name. Okay, so that's already built, it's ready to go. Let's start ArcGIS Pro. And here is our start button on Visual Studio. So we got our splash. And we're just gonna load up a very simple project here, which is called Feature Test, which is one of the data sets that are available with the community samples. We have an extensive set of data for you to use with all of the different samples for the different APIs. Okay. All right, so this is just a little uh, area for us to actually try out the tool. As we select the test polygons, uh, we can see the different types of sketch tools here. And at the end is our new tool that we've created. And there's our tool tip, construct polygons and show acres. We'll activate the tool. And then come over here and just sketch out what perhaps might be a new area that's slated for some development. And double click that. And since we set our breakpoint and we're running uh, Pro in debug mode within Visual Studio, I'm back in the code. And now we can actually walk through the code, getting the area, rounding it. We can analyze the 
values here and there's 17.85. Let's continue on, come back to Pro, and there's our dialog box, 17.85. Okay, we'll say okay, and there's our new newly constructed feature. Okay, so this is just how easy it is to create a brand new construction tool and incorporate some custom code and get that in, integrated into your workflows inside of Pro. All right, so that's add-ins. I'm now gonna turn things over to Rob to walk us through the next pattern, next set of patterns, managed configurations. All right, Rob. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna hand Rick. things over to you here. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start by sharing my screen over here. All right, and we're gonna take a look at the other patterns here, starting with managed configurations. As uh, Chris was showing in the introduction area, with a configuration, you can customize the pro startup experience and also include some of your organization's branding. So there are some visual aspects to the startup like the splash screen and the start page and the about page. And these are areas where you can make customizations. We have a template to get started. So as you're in the Visual Studio getting going, you can start with the manage configuration template. Configurations really take add-ins to the next level. The format that they're stored in is, it's still an archive file. It's a like a compressed zip file. And inside there, you'll have any add-ins that you're delivering, plus the descriptions of your visual aspects, like the start page and the splash screen, and then the brains of the operation and the configuration manager. This is where you'll be able to find out information about the portal that the user is connected to, and then make some decisions about what the user interface should look like. Everything starts in the DAML. So the configuration manager is defined declaratively there. There's also a class representing the configuration manager that's going to contain some overridable methods. That's how you can take over the startup behavior. Some of those methods are very visual. So there's an override for the start, startup, the splash, and the about. These overrides, though, are all optional. When I'm teaching a class, some of my students usually ask, hey, I, I don't really want to take time to make my own splash screen. It looks very complex and artistic. Can I just use the regular pro splash screen? And yes, yeah, the, op, the overrides are optional and you can return no from any of the overrides. You just want to have the pro standard behavior take place and you don't want to do any customization there. The non-visual overrides are where you can gather information and make some decisions. So the ones I'm pointing to here are sort of the behind the scenes and the brains of the operation where you can make those decisions. In the on application initializing method, if we look in the API reference here, it says, oh yeah, in this method, it's safe to communicate with the portal. Oh, okay. So then you could use the ArcGIS portal manager to get information. Uh, first, finding out what portal you're connected to and then getting information about the user that signed in, their name, their the groups they belong to, their user role and type, and any items they might have associated with them on their portal. The other, uh, one of the other methods is on update database. And this method is where here it says in the API reference that it's your last chance for communicating and manipulating with the DAML before it gets processed. So in the on update database override, you receive an XML format database representing the UI just before it opens up to the user. As Pro starts, it's looking for any of its extensions and the DAML and any of your add-ins and their DAML, and it puts it all together into this database. 
then when Pro opens up, you see all of the tabs that are related to ArcGIS Pro, the standard tabs, and then you might see any extra tabs that uh, the add-ins are bringing in. Well, now that we have we've looked at two of these decision or two of these uh, overrides, one of them you can use to find out your user status up on their portal. The other one you can find out about the UI. And then in between, you could make decisions with your code. So you can receive that XML database. And now that you know what your user status is, you could put together the user interface customized just to that user. Or maybe you find out what group they belong to. And then if they're part of the editing group, then you design the user interface just for folks that are part of the editing group. And so here we end up with just a tab and a very focused user interface that can guide that group of users through their workflow. Of course, some of our knowledgeable users know that they can go to the backstage area and the customize the ribbon option, and they could just add back in some of those tabs that you work so hard to remove. Well, back in the DAML where the configuration manager is defined, we have the block customization dialogue attribute. And that'll just remove that choice, so users won't be able to customize after after that. Well, let's check check out some examples here. I'm going to do uh, some demonstrations first. I'm going to start with a real configuration that's out there that you could take advantage of and try it out today. Then I'm going to look at how do you make a configuration using Visual Studio. And then we're going to examine one of the samples and its configuration manager that makes some of those decisions. All right, so I'm going to leave my Visual Studio here. I'm going to go to start an application. And we have an application called ArcGIS Pro for Intelligence. You can download this from the ArcGIS Solutions page. It's one of the many solutions that you can download. And when you do that, it comes with its own installation. The installation brings in the configuration for ArcGIS Pro for Intelligence. There's help and other things that are also installed. But here, let's start up the configuration to see that, oh, OK, this ArcGIS Pro for Intelligence has its own splash screen. It's very customized. And it's also going to have its own startup page where the user can find new projects or start new projects or find existing projects. And part of this uh, configuration is to have a nice carousel on the startup page. So users can just go through the carousel here and find a map to open up or a project to open up and then get started with their work. As uh, Pro opens, it's changing the user interface and the tabs that appear. When you first look here, it almost looks like, oh, those seem to be the standard tabs, like uh, the analysis tab. But when you go there, look at all the extra functionality that's appearing. It's almost totally different than the regular analysis tab. All right, so that's a real configuration. Let's try to create one. So here I'm going to start up Visual Studio. I'm going to create a new project. And here is the Manage Configuration template that I'm going to use to get started. I'm just going to go with the default naming here and create the new project. And inside the project, we'll see that, oh, OK, here's the Configuration Manager defined in the DAML. Here's the Configuration Manager class over here. Also, you get the UI parts, <laughs> which include the About page the start page, the splash screen. They just give us a real standard splash screen to get started here, nothing too fancy. But you can see that in the splash screen, you can use the WPF controls over here to put in other images or colors or backgrounds or text and make it look or make it follow along with your organization's branding descriptions. The other XML that's included is the start page. Now I'm just going to do a quick build here so that the start page shows up. But the start page, the splash screen, and the about page, they're all WPF controls. They all have their own XAML 
where you can define all the parts and pieces that are appearing. You can use the tools over here, of course, and then if you wanted to put another button on there, you just double click the button and add it right over there onto your uh, onto your start page. And then you'll see the button defined in XAML down below. All right, the next thing I wanna do is, oh, let me close out of my Visual Studio there. The next thing I wanna do is show one of the samples. I've downloaded the samples to my machine. I've got uh, the community samples here and I've, I'm going to go to the framework set of samples. And in here, you'll see that there's two configuration samples. There's configure with map and config with start wizard. I wanna look at config with map and I'm gonna go ahead and open up this sample and see what it looks like. As the sample is opening, you'll see that it comes with a lot of code. It has a uh, config.daml where the configuration is defined over here. It has its configuration manager class, and then it has descriptions for the splash screen. So we have all the XAML that goes into building the splash screen. And this one has an interesting start page where it has uh, a map. And then there's the counties on here and each polygon represents a project that the user can click a county and then open the project that way. Let me go ahead and start this up. And we'll take a look at what happens when we get started here. So we get the custom splash screen. There's a little animation going on there. You design the splash screen as, as you would like to see it. And then the start page where your user is selecting and getting started with a project, uh, here they can click on the various counties and then open the project related to that county. And when the project opens, it comes with just a tab. And then that tab has a very focused workflow for this type of user where they're analyzing these power line supports and they can make a selection, then they can show those sites, start editing, and uh, in the end, create a mobile package. They could pan and zoom around as needed, but they don't have all the other tabs that might distract them from their workflow. All right, I'm gonna close out of there. And what I wanna do now is look at the code that gives us just the one tab. So let's take a look at the configuration manager over here. And we're gonna look at the C-sharp code inside here. And we're looking at the on update database override. And in the override, we're given the database. And then here they're taking the database and finding all the tabs inside. So that's uh, all of the DAML gathered together. And we're looking for all the tabs and then looping on all those tabs and finding the ones that don't start with Acme or config with map. So the ones that don't start with these keywords, we're putting them into this elements hash set. And then having another loop that says, oh yeah, by the way, remove all the tabs. Remove all those tabs that don't start with Acme or config with map. That's why we end up with just the one tab. All right, the other override I wanna show here is, uh, yeah, we could take a look at the splash screen and it's override where inside the inside here, we're saying, hey, use our splash screen over here instead of the pro splash screen. If we wanted pros splash screen, instead of returning our splash screen, we could return null and we would just get the standard behavior there. All right, well, let's come on back here. We've looked at an existing configuration that you can use immediately. Then we've looked at the process to create a configuration and the template that's available. And then we tried to look at the configuration manager a little bit to see where you could make some decisions about what the user interface looks like. We're gonna move to our, our third, <laughs> our third uh, extensibility point, which is plug-in data source. And I find this one is, usually this question comes up in my classes a lot where people are saying, 
hey, I have these data formats that I can't add to Pro and Pro doesn't recognize these data formats. Well, Pro recognizes a lot of different data formats like shape files and file geodatabases and enterprise uh, databases. But some of these like the MySQL and the older, like the personal geodatabase that ArcMap supported or supports, the MDB files that are the access format and then MongoDB. But usually the questions I have in my classes have to do with, hey, our organization, we have our own proprietary data format. And uh, I have to figure out a way to convert that data into one of the acceptable formats, but that takes me a while. How can I just use my data as it sits? And the way to do that is with by creating a plug-in data source for your proprietary or obscure or some well-known data formats that might be file-based or databases or web services. And what we want to do is make that data available. And our first area that we need to work on is in the catalog. We want to see our data in the catalog along with the supported Esri data formats. So these custom data stores, uh, data sources, they're going to show up in the catalog once you've built them. And they're going to show up as regular feature classes over there in the catalog so that you can go to one of those feature classes and right click on it and add it to the map. And then it becomes a feature layer on the map that you can symbolize and you can open its table. The data is read only. So even though we're adding it to the map and symbolizing, you can't edit the data in those custom data sources. However, all the other functionality is fair game, like making queries and selections and running the buffer tool on those selections and just displays on the map, setting symbology. All of those are available. What I want to do next is just review our data access objects. Where when you need to connect to some data in the catalog, there's actually a pattern that you follow. And the first part of the pattern is working with a connector. I'm going to go through here using an enterprise geodatabase in my explanation, but the connector is really file based where you're specifying the location of a folder, like for a file geodatabase or a, a folder of shape files, or your connector might be a file like an SDE database connection file, like I'm going to explore here. So the connector gets us to the data store. The data store is really that container that's holding feature classes and tables. So the data store, in this case, it's the enterprise geodatabase. In the case of our file geodatabase, it's that actual geodatabase container. So we call that the data store. There's a class that represents data store. Going on a little deeper then, inside the data store, there are the tables and feature classes that show up. The data store is a container. And then once you look at one of those uh, feature classes, you can add it to the map. There's a table behind the scenes. And we have an object called a cursor. If you've done the Arc Objects programming, you probably worked a lot with cursors over there. But this is our way to get at records and rows and features inside the table. And with the cursor then, we can build up a collection of rows and then iterate through them. Well, this is sta the standard data access objects behavior. Now you have your own data format and you want to create some kind of a connection to get to your data source. Well, you're going to be implementing classes of your own that represent these same classes that already exist for our regular data. So you're, you'll have a class plug in data source connection path that represents the connector. And then there's a data source template that represents the location where the data is contained. There's a table template to get us access to the tables and then a cursor to be able to loop through the records in the table. 
And then there's a row to get to each row and interact with it. So as you build your custom data source, you'll be responsible for implementing these classes. Let's take a look here. We're going to look at one of the community samples here. I'm going to carefully go out and let me close my existing Visual Studio and I'm going to start up a new Visual Studio session. And this time I'm going to go to the sample here that is the plugin data source sample. It's called Pro Data Reader. And as I open up the Pro Data Reader, oh, before that opens, let me let me show you the data that I'm going to be working with here. So in the I've got a folder here that has it has a GPX file in it. So a lot of the popular GPS units uh, these days make GPX files. If I open this up with Notepad, a GPX file, it looks like a, just an XML file that's keeping track of our X and Y coordinates from a, a path that we've walked. So this data format isn't directly supported. We have to, so we want to support it. Also, whenever I go on a vacation, I take a lot of photos with my uh, my iPhone, and then those photos all have their latitude, longitude inside them. But I'd like to treat this as a feature class that I could add to a map. I'd like to treat this GPX file as a feature class that I can add to a map. So that's our, how do we get started here? Well, we have these a couple of reasons to get started. We have some data that isn't directly supported as a feature class. Well, here in the sample, there are two plug-in data sources that have been defined. One is for the GPX file, and one is for the collection of JPEGs. And as we expand these here, either one of them, you'll see that, oh, okay, here are those extra classes that have to be implemented. The plug-in data source, the plug-in table, and then the plug-in cursor to get us to those separate records. So here the cursor would get us to each of the GPS points in that GPS file, or it would get us up here in the, whoops, in the JPEG, it would get us to each of the JPEGs and treat them as their own record in a table. I'm gonna go ahead and run here, and then we'll check out what this uh, looks like and how Pro changes just a little bit. So as Pro is starting, I'm going to open up a project here that I've just a simple project with a map in it to get us get us going here. Here's my web project. Okay, and then directing our attention over here to the catalog pane. I'm going to navigate out to the folder where my I was just showing you where my data was located. So I'm going to go out to that same location now and take a look at how that data looks a little. Whoop, let me select my location here. And we're testing the plugin. Whoops, let me get to my data. OK. <laughs> All right, I can see the data out there. And uh, something odd has happened where I should see my custom folder showing up here or custom project item showing up in my folder. And for some reason, as I'm going out to my data here, it is, wait, let me see if I've clicked in the right place here. Okay, well, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> Um, let me just stop my project and do a rebuild on it. Let me see if I can get it going here. <laughs> Something always happens when you're getting ready to do the demo. Let me see if I can restart here and see if we can see that customization. I'm not sure what happened here, but uh, we'll check it out. And Rob, not sure if you have another instance of Pro running in the background um, with one of the configurations. Just one just other check thing to check. Out. Thanks. It seemed like I just have the one instance running. Yeah. All right, let me go here to my web project. And 
actually. Let me open up my test project here. Okay. Go into the data. And coming on down here to my plugin data. There we go. There we go. Okay, so there's my plugin data. I'm going to add it to my project so it shows up over here as a custom project item. And then we could take a look in here and we'll see that uh, when we go to the data sources, we'll see that, oh, okay, here's the GPX representing the hiking. Uh, location it shows up as a feature class here's my hawaii uh, folder and inside there i have my hawaii jpeg images and it shows up as a feature class and let me just make a quick new map over here i'm going to insert a new map and then i'm going to right click on my hawaii jpeg and add it to the current map all right and then we'll see that it shows up as a feature layer we can open up the attribute table and see all the images treated as now records in a table. And then those images appear on the map as points. And if I click on some of those points, I'll see that they get selected. All right, let's go on and let's uh, move on to the next example here. I'm going to bring up my presentation here. And uh, so we've looked at the plugin data source, and now let's go on to finish up with core host. So in my classes, students will usually ask, hey, we've been doing a lot of work with Pro. Do we have to do all of our customizations inside of ArcGIS Pro? And uh, the answer there is no, you can use core and core host assemblies. They can be in the add-ins, but they can also be embedded into WPF apps and console apps. We really only get access to the geodatabase and geometry classes over there but for those folks that are needing to do like a, a nightly update they could build a windows console app and register it with a scheduler and pick a, a time interval like every night at midnight go out to the database and do some updates out there there are a couple of requirements here though to build these standalone apps pro needs to be installed on that machine and the licensing needs to be configured where you're authorizing for offline work or you set an automatic sign in. On the Visual Studio side for the build platform target, we need to have that set to 64 bit. And then we need to use this host initialize. That is allowing us to connect to those assemblies and get to those classes. When you use the template to build one of these apps, It'll stub out a little bit of code to set up for the threading model, and it'll have the host initialize in there so that you can focus on your business logic and what do you need to do at that uh, inside that app. Well, let's take a look here at one of the community samples for the WPF app. I'm going to go ahead here and uh, I'm going to stop Visual Studio. And then let me restart Visual Studio. Actually, let me go to the samples. I'm going to go to my community samples that I've downloaded. I'm going to go to Core Host and open up Core Host GDB and get this one open here. So as we're looking at, as we're getting the sample going, we can see that, OK, the threading model is set up. We can see that the core, the host has been initialized. And then from there, there, we're building an application over here. And since that core host has been initialized, when we go to look at the view model here for the geodatabase connections, we can see, let me go to line 315. Oh, good, I've got my breakpoint in there already. But you can see here that, oh yeah, we're, using some of the geodatabase classes out here. So here we're connecting. Remember back to that data access object pattern. We're making that file path connection. From there, we're getting the data store, the file geodatabase. And then from there, we can get at the tables. From the tables, we can do a query 
or use the cursor to get at the fields inside those tables. And we can use the cursor to get at the rows in that table too. All right, let's, I'm gonna go ahead and run this app with that breakpoint. And then we'll see that, uh, yeah, this is a standalone application. Our user does some navigation here to find a geodatabase. I'm just gonna go into my temp folder here and get the San Diego geodatabase and open it up. As it opens, I get a list of its feature classes. I'm gonna click on major attractions and then read goes and gets, uses that cursor to get, oh, it hasn't done it yet. It's brought us to the breakpoint. It's just about to use the cursor to get at the fields and the rows inside that table. So here it starts to use the geodatabase objects and builds a list of all the records from that table. All right, let's bring it back together here. Uh, we've looked at four different patterns here, add-ins and configurations, plug-in data sources, and we've just finished with standalone apps. And for here, I'm gonna turn things back over to Chris to take some of your questions, but first look at the roadmap and share some resources. That was great, Rob. Thanks very much. All right, really Chris. like the, the plug-in data sources. <laughs> All right, yeah, let me uh, let me share back with you here. Okay, I'm just selecting and I'm gonna make you the presenter. All right. Go ahead, take over, Chris. Excellent, thank you. All right. Okay, all right. So we just wanna wrap up today with some roadmap and resources information for you. So here's the ArcGIS Pro roadmap. And the uh, this is always found on GeoNet, standard documentation with each release. And this is the roadmap from back at 2.5, back in February. The items in green, you can see we've, we've broken this out always by near-term, mid-term, and long-term. Near-term being the, the, the next couple releases. <clears throat> and the items in green are specifically what is going to be provided here with ArcGIS Pro 2.6. And um, moving on to our next slide, you can see that we had our release back in February with 2.5 and ArcGIS Pro 2.6 is coming here in July. And we're targeting the last week of this month in July for the release of 2.6 and of course with the SDK as well. And the next release uh, of Pro 2.7 will be coming sometime in Q1 of next year. So what's coming with the SDK at 2.6? Um, you might have noticed that uh, graphics uh, are right at the top of the list in the near term that's provided. And we're really excited that uh, the map authoring team has made this available. And so you'll be able to take advantage of the graphics layer. And so all that capability that's there for inserting, updating and deleting map graphic elements, including text elements, you can start to work with this with the SDK. You can start working with geometry and symbology and all of the different ways of working and interacting with the elements like selection, grouping and alignment, and so on. The screenshots below are of the graphics layer SDK sample that you'll be able to get with the 2.6 release, and that'll be up with the community samples on GitHub. And uh, this is a great sample for really trying out all those different patterns and techniques of working with graphic elements. So definitely check that out. There's gonna be some editing API updates for custom snapping and events, and you'll be able to control and manage snapping by layer. And as always, we'll have general updates to all of our existing APIs and SDK templates and documentation. All right, so different resources for the SDK. We always like to um, point everyone to the landing page where you can get links to the API reference and samples and all the documentation, quick links right at the top. You can go to pro.arcgis.com and click on the SDK tab and find this page. So it includes ArcGIS tutorials, um, links to the Pro SDK group on GeoNet, text session video recordings, uh, links to the instructor-led training, and ArcGIS blog posts. A little bit more about the SDK group on GeoNet. This is a really, uh, popular and active group, and we really would uh, welcome you to participate with the community where you can collaborate with other developers and ESRI staff, 
Um, a lot of the, the different development teams are very active here in responding to questions and discussion topics here on the group. Um, feel free to ask your technical questions and search on the existing threads of questions. It's a great way to find answers to your questions quickly by leveraging that knowledge base that's been growing over the past few years. Um, we welcome your feedback here on the group and you can also get product updates. A little bit on learning opportunities. Um, the instructor-led training course, Extending ArcGIS Pro with Add-ins, this is one of the many courses that Rob teaches and um, it's a comprehensive three-day course. And uh, you can really jumpstart your development with the SDK and learn all of the patterns and uh, best practices. And as you've seen from Rob's work today, um, get a better understanding of, of how to get started with um, the, all the techniques and the patterns. Finally, the, the Dev Summit 2020 videos uh, that were released earlier this year, we had 14 Pro SDK technical sessions. And each of these sessions are really, really helpful in giving you deep dives into the APIs and the patterns from the different product teams. These are all hosted on the Esri Events channel on YouTube. And you can search on this uh, blog post here and get the full list of all the sessions, plus a playlist on YouTube. The ArcGIS Marketplace is available for Esri business partners to create pro add-in listings. They're also providing uh, some different add-ins for free and trial add-ins for users to try. So you can visit marketplace.arcgis.com and those two add-ins that we showed earlier in the presentation are also available, Cyclomedia Street Smart and the Unconventionals Analyst. Finally, the user conference is coming here, uh, July 13th. So we're gonna have many ArcGIS Pro sessions that you can take advantage of. And we will have the virtual Esri showcase this year. So you can find the ArcGIS Pro SDK for .NET subtopic which will be located in the ArcGIS Pro and developers areas. You can ask your technical questions in the chat and request a meeting or demonstration there in the uh, virtual UC platform. And so see the UC site for more information. Here's the link. Okay, your feedback is really important to us and it helps to drive out the SDK development. We welcome your input on new requirements and we wanna know more about your specific workflows and needs. You can provide your feedback here at the ProSDK group on GeoNet that we mentioned before. And here's the URL. As well as if you're um, familiar with posting ArcGIS ideas on GeoNet, you can also use that uh, way of actually posting your ideas for the SDK. Here's our uh, email addresses at the bottom and Rob and I are uh, always available for your questions and feedback on this presentation. And we wanna say thank you very much for attending this morning. And uh, Amy, I'll turn it back to you, see if there's any questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we're going, we, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to get through all the questions. We'll try to get through maybe one or two if uh, uh, we can get you to answer them real quick. Uh, Chris and Rob. Uh, the first question is, does the Pro SDK support NuGet packages? Yes, absolutely. Um, we've been doing that for a few releases now. Um, there is a link to the NuGet packages up in the documentation site, as well as you can go right to the, the NuGet site um, and search on the ArcGIS Pro extensions. So I'm really happy to be able to have the NuGets out there as well. Perfect, thank you. Is it possible to create a file geo database and lock its access to just one particular add-in? So with the uh, geo database API, you've got a lot of control over working with um, file geo databases. The locking is something that um, you know we would have to follow up on um, in the uh, I guess as we follow up with the uh, the post for for this webinar we can get into some more details about how you could actually work with geo databases in that way. Thank you, Chris and Rob, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, ArcGIS Pro SDK for .NET Extensibility Patterns. I know there were quite a few questions we didn't get to, but whatever uh, we have that we uh, 
we received, we will be posting on GeoNet, and the link is there in, in your chat for you to review, and um, we should have that up within the week. Uh, if you have any other questions, please contact me using my email address and your follow-up email. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. And on behalf of Esri and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.